Oh, hello there. I'm running out of quippy greetings because it turns out isolation is a real blow to one's creativity. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I'm Liv, that woman who's still yelling at you about gods and the patriarchy, even during a pandemic. This week, we're taking another break in the story of Aeneas. I do hope you all can still follow it with all these breaks, but they're keeping me sane because truly the Aeneid is no odyssey, and I need a bit more heavy entertainment during this. It is very boring being alone in your apartment all the fucking time. So today we're here with giants. This story has taken a while because, honestly, there isn't that much to it. It was an important aspect of the rise of the Olympians into power, but it wasn't told in too many sources. Namely, just Apollodorus that I've found, and that guy was a little too much like Hemingway for my liking. Brief. But while brief, it is pretty fun. You know how mythological wars can be. So let me bring you back. The world was started by our Mother Earth, Gaia, and Uranus, the sky, and they had their titan children who overthrew Uranus, and two of those titans, Kronos and Rhea, had more children, the gods, who then overthrew them, because there's a theme. It was the very first episode of this podcast, or if you're a patron, you can also listen to the first chapter of a book of mythology I will eventually finish that I recorded as an episode. It also tells the story, though in more detail. Either way, what I've just said is the gist that you need to know for now anyway. Mini-myth. The Gigantomachy. It's a war with giants. Gaia, our Mother Earth, was pretty pissed about how things went down between the Olympians, the new generation, and the Titans. The boomers, you might say. Or maybe don't, that shit's volatile. Anyway, Gaia, the mother of all, was not thrilled with how things shook out there. And so, in this version of the Theogony, in Apollodorus, she gives birth to the race of giants as punishment for how the Olympians treated the Titans. Now, chronologically, this is tricky. The Gigantomachy, that is, the war between the Olympians and the Giants, wasn't talked about in anyone as early as Homer or Hesiod, but later on, it became one of the most referenced wars of mythology. It's used in vase paintings and on temple friezes regularly. It's quite the common story. But at the same time, it doesn't track to anything as old as determining how and when everyone was born. That's all to say, Apollodorus, in his telling of the story, does say the giants are birthed, like I told you, from the blood that falls when Kronos castrates his father Uranus? You remember that story. But then that would suggest that it happened before the Olympians defeated the Titans, so honestly, who the fuck knows? The point is, Gaia, Earth, births a race of giants in one way or another. They are, as you might imagine, quite giant. They're also said to be just completely unbeatable, too strong, crazy strong. And they're terrifying, too. They have long, thick hair coming from their heads and their cheeks. So maybe they're hipsters, but giant? I don't know. They're hairy, though. And their feet have dragon's scales. Interesting. They come at the Olympians pretty quickly as their punishment for their defeat of the Titans. They want to appease their mother, Gaia, and Gaia's pissed. They start throwing rocks and trees that they set on fire up at the heavens to provoke the gods. And provoke they do. The strongest, most impressive of the giants are named Porphyrion and Alcyonius. Alcyonius is even completely immortal, provided, there's a caveat to his immortality, provided he's fighting on the same land where he was born. They're pretty hardcore, he and Porphyrion, is the point being made here. Meanwhile, in the world of the Olympians, they had heard from the Oracle that none of the giants could be killed by the gods themselves. What? Not an ideal thing to hear. Just not the best news. I mean, what are you supposed to do if none of the gods can kill these dudes? Who can possibly do it? Well, this oracle also said that if the gods had a mortal fighting alongside them, then... And only then, they could beat the giants. So I ask again, who could possibly do this? Who could fight alongside the Greek Olympians to beat back the giants, threatening their dominion over the earth? It could only be 
the man, the myth, the legend, the one who can go the distance, the one sung of by the muses, Huncules. No, I'm sorry, Hercules. No, that's wrong too. God damn it, Disney. The only man that can fight alongside the Olympians to beat the giants is Heracles. But before the Olympians can get a hold of Heracles, Gaia tries to counter this new threat to her giants. She hears about this prophecy by the oracle, and she wants to stop it from coming true. She hears about an herb, a powerful herb that can prevent the giants from being killed, even by this mortal who is destined to succeed. The power of plants, you guys. But Zeus, too, hears about this herb, so it's a race to the gardens. Zeus orders the goddess of the dawn and the moon and the god of the sun to hide away not to shine their light upon the earth for as long as is necessary. And so, under the cover of darkness, Zeus picks the herb for himself and sends Athena to find Heracles and to bring him to their side of this battle against the giants. So Athena has found Heracles, she's brought him to their side, and Heracles is happy to help, zero to hero and all that. So before long, he's fighting Alcyoneus, shooting him with arrows and shit, and at first it seems like it's really working. The giants fall to the earth in what I can only imagine was a pretty hardcore earthquake-like event, but just as predicted, the giant quickly regains his strength. It won't be that easy, Heracles. So while Athena is there to provide him with advice, Heracles uses his hero levels of strength and drags Alcyoneus off the land where he was born. And then, well then, yeah, it was pretty easy. Next thing we hear, and that giant's been defeated. But they still have the other powerful one, Porphyrion, to deal with. The giant begins his attack on Heracles and Hera, Zeus trying to counter this, does what only Zeus would think is a good and practical idea. Prepare yourselves. Are you ready for the most Zeus solution ever? (sighs) Zeus makes Porphyrion lust for Hera, of course. And so when Porphyrion tries to rape Hera, getting to the point of actually tearing off her clothes, then Zeus hits him with a lightning bolt and Heracles kills the giant with a shot from his bow. Now, Zeus, for real though, what exactly was gained by having Porphyrion try to rape Hera? From what I can tell, absolutely nothing. Are we to believe that something about an attempted rape put him in a position to be hit with a lightning bolt when he couldn't have been before? He's a fucking giant. If it's easy to hit him then, I think it'd be pretty easy to hit him in general. Anyway, Zeus is a fucking pig, and Hera deserves better. Meanwhile, other giants are dealt with by some of the other gods. Ephialtes is shot in the eye by Apollo, and then in the other eye by Heracles. Boom, he's dead. Eurotos is done away with by Dionysus with his thyrsus. So many yeses. His thyrsus is a reed staff thing, usually used during a drunken bacchanalia, but I guess it has multiple purposes. The giant Clitios is defeated by our girl Hecate with her badass witchy torches. The giant Mimas, meanwhile, is handled by Hephaestus and his red hot irons. Of course, Athena, not one to be outdone by these other gods killing giants in cool and innovative ways, throws a goddamn island, the whole of Sicily, on the giant Enceladus. This, the ancients believed, is what caused the volcano Mount Etna to be all rumbly. That said, some believed it was this giant, and some believed it was the monster Typhon that lay beneath Sicily, and therefore Etna. Depends who you talk to. Either way, there's something big and angry and, dare I say it, volcanic under that island. After Athena throws a whole damn island on top of Enceladus, though, she takes things to a whole new level by straight up flaying Bolton style the giant palace and taking his leftover skin to use as protection for herself for the rest of the battle. Gross, but creative, I guess. This is also one of the instances where maybe she took her name Pallas from, but I prefer the other one I told you about Triton's daughter learning battle. 
next up, Poseidon, who chased after Polybotes through the sea before finally reaching the island of Kos, where he broke off a piece, named it Nisiros, and threw it on top of the giant. This became its own island with, like Sicily, its own volcano. But we're not done yet. Hermes, wearing the cap of Hades, because it seems like Hades wanted none of this shit and totally isn't a part of it at all, killed the giant Hippolytos. Artemis killed Gratian, a death with absolutely no story behind it. The fates, even, had their hand in the battle, killing Agrios and Thoun with bronze cudgels like three badass ladies normally used to measuring and cutting string. And finally, it seems... Zeus killed all the remaining giants, the number of which is unclear. But what is clear is that all of them, as they were dying, were shot with arrows by Heracles, who, like his father, needed to involve himself in absolutely everything, even if he wasn't needed or being particularly helpful at all. Men. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, man, for such an important war, that was a pretty lightly told story, Liv. I mean, it's really short, which I didn't realize it would be this short. Anyway, you might be thinking, Liv, you're better than that. And you'd be right. I am better than that. But the thing is, I am only so good as my source is. And this one, it's told almost nowhere and certainly not by anyone I could find that was particularly detailed in their storytelling. The main ancient source for the Gigantomachy is Apollodorus in his Library of Greek Mythology. But Apollodorus isn't very showy with his language. He was much more to the point. Here is what happened. Here is how it happened. Bang, boom, done. It seems that this story was more shown than told, because it appears in so many pieces of art and everything, namely on friezes, above even the Parthenon, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. But it wasn't written down with the same vigorous storytelling as some other mythological origins. So honestly, this episode is already like three times as long as the paragraph and a half that Apollodorus uses to tell this important story. There is, quite tragically, only so much I can do when we lack ancient sources. So I'll say again, what I would not give to go back there and talk to people, read things, learn everything I possibly could. Can we get time travel already? Fuck. Anyway, thank you all for listening. I've wanted to tell this story for so long, but the old issue of sources kept getting in my goddamn way. But I'm working on some more heavily researched episodes right now, so a little quick short one to give you guys in the meantime was key. So do your thing. Rate, review, subscribe. Most of you have got the time right now. I just know it. You're all the bomb. Stay safe and healthy. Stay inside if you can and binge my fucking podcast, okay? I'm Liv and I love this shit. Wash your hands.